Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. It's good to see all of us <laughs> who are here this morning. Good morning. We're here to worship God. Amen. 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 Let us read the call to worship together. Have mercy on us, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, blot out our transgression. Wash away all our transgressions and our sins always before us. Against you, you only, have we sinned and done what is evil in your sight? Let us hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Create in us a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within us. Do not cast us from your presence, or take your Holy Spirit from us. Restore unto us the joy of your salvation, and grant us the Holy Spirit to sustain us. Let us pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father and our God, your name is glorious and wonderful. We sing about your wonderful name and your gracious work. We worship you this morning. We gather in your presence in unity of faith to ask that you bless us this morning. Without your power and grace, we can do nothing. We pray that your glory continues to fill and radiate within our lives so that we can be your ambassadors in this dark and difficult world. Let none of us leave this worship this morning empty-handed, but let us be filled with your Spirit. Let us leave this house this morning rejoicing in a full and free salvation, knowing fully well that you are with us, you promise never to leave us nor forsake us. We ask that you would just bless our worship this morning. Let all we say and do be to your honor and to your glory, and nothing be done of self. We ask, O oh God, that you would forgive our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness so that we can come before you in boldness. We ask these mercies in the name of Jesus and the church say, Amen.
Father, we dedicate our lives to you. Thank you for the plan that you have for our lives. You have a plan for us in every area of life. According to Jeremiah 29 and 11, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper and not harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. We pray this morning For the spirit of obedience, not rebellion or pride, not resistance or hard heartedness, but for a soft, sensitive heart that is willing to do your will. We thank you this morning that you are the resurrection and the life. The death has no power over you. You rose from the dead with power and might. So during this Lenten season, we remember that. Because we want nothing to be able to separate us from your love. We thank you this morning that you are our protector and provider. You have said that when we call on you in prayer, you will listen. So hear our prayers this morning for this world in which we live. There are problems in every part of this world. But in a very special way, we remember Ukraine. Remember our brothers and sisters there who suffer The wrath of war. One that is uncalled for, one that is unnecessary. A brutal one. But God, we know that everything is time limited. You set a time for everything. And we know that one way or another, this war will come to its end. Soon. And we'll give you the glory. We cannot at this time tell what the outcome may be. But whatever it is, God, we know that you allow it. We live with the possibility of trials and tribulation intruding in our lives. We thank you this morning that you are still in control of every part of our bodies. And so sickness may leave us stress and may steal time from all the things that we want to be doing. But we know that you have the power to heal and even sickness will have its time. I come to you this morning asking for your touch, Lord. <coughs> Help us to be patient and allow you to do your work in us, with us, and through us. If doctors are involved, with our sicknesses. Give them wisdom. And thank you for providing the help we need. Those of our loved ones who are sick this morning, 
We ask for faith for them that will enable them to weather the storms of their illness. Faith to hope and faith to hold on to your unchanging hand, the hand that heals and delivers us from all our sicknesses and our infirmities. I look to you this morning for the promises in your word that assure us of your presence and your help. Finally, O oh Lord, we ask that you teach us what you want us to learn during these unpleasant times. Help us not to take out and walk away from you. Yes, discomfort all around we see and we feel. But show us how to be patient. Bless your church, O oh God. In your wisdom, grant us what we need. We ask these mercies in the name of the one to whom we pray, even Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Repeat the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen.
there that we're going to sing. I have a story. I have a song. should have a song. Amen. Amen. The first reading today is from Job chapter 9 verses 13 to 22. 22. Oh, chapter 1, sorry. One day when Job's children were having a feast at the home of their oldest brother, a messenger came running to Job. We were plowing in the fields with the oxen, he said, and the donkeys were in a nearby pasture. Suddenly the Sabians attacked and stole them all. They killed every one of your servants except me. I am the only one who escaped to tell you. Before he had finished speaking, another servant came and said, Lightning struck the sheep and the shepherds and killed them all. I am the only one who escaped to tell you. Before he had finished speaking, another servant came and said, Three bands of Chaldean raiders attacked us, took away the camels, and killed all your servants except me. I am the only one who escaped to tell you. Before he had finished speaking, another servant came and said, Your children were having a feast at the home of your oldest son, when a storm swept in from the desert, it blew the house down and killed them all. I am the only one who escaped to tell you. Then Job got up and tore his clothes in grief. He shaved his head and threw himself face downward on the ground. He said, I was born with nothing and I will die with nothing. The Lord gave and now he is taken away. May his name be praised. In spite of everything that had happened, Job did not sin by blaming God. The second reading is from 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 9 and 10, verse, verse 9 and 10. But his answer was, My grace is all you need, for my power is greatest when you are weak. I am most happy then to be proud of my weaknesses in order to feel the protection of Christ's power over me. I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and difficulties for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Amen.
my theme for Lent. Last week I talked about burdens. The scripture was ably read by Steve. And this morning I want to talk about the intrusion of trials and tribulation. And I deliberately chose the word intrusion because we don't have trials and tribulation just every day. We, they, they tend to come when life is going good. And all of a sudden, they intrude. Their existence may be for a while. But very often, they are time limited. They come and they go. They intrude in our life. Amen? Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, we thank you that we could come together for corporate worship. And God, we sense your presence. Somebody writes, there is a sweet, sweet spirit in this place. And we know it's the spirit of God. Oh, Holy Spirit. Guide our thoughts now. Take away any distractions there may be so that we're able to focus on your word. It is in Christ's name we pray. Amen. This morning, <clears throat> The focus is on trials and tribulations and how we deal with them. The trials we face are often diverse. And are more intense than others. Many times they involve loss. Loss of someone you love. Loss of a job. Loss of property. A divorce. A broken friendship. You see, trials are hard and they're often painful. Sometimes our trials and our tribulation is a result of the actions of others. Other times we see it as an act of God. A result of an act, an act of God. We, we hear Christians say things like, I've been doing everything right. I have been fasting and praying. I have been giving to and loving my neighbors. I've been reading the scripture daily. And I've been walking faithfully with the Lord. What wrong did I do? Why has God allowed me to go through these hard times? Does he care about me? Or am I really saved? Are these things happening to me because I'm not saved? The 
The truth is that the Bible says that those who follow Christ, that those who follow God's word, that those who follow his commandments will face trials and tribulation. So may, may as well we open ourselves to that reality that when trials and tribulations come our way, we don't think that God is necessarily punishing us. But it's, it's, it's a part of living in this broken world. We are often afflicted by incurable diseases or illnesses. Natural disasters. Disasters of a financial nature. Domestic tragedies, such as divorce that often tear apart families. Accidents on the road and accidents on life's highways. And tragedies that we face on dead-end streets where all hopeful expectations are brought to a stop. Let's take a look at Job. In, in, in the text, Job is being presented by God as the ultimate example of a man who struggled with suffering. I accidentally find myself talking with persons who are going through hard times and they will let me know Reverend Brignan, I'm not joking. <laughs> I don't even want to hear more joke this morning because I'm not joking. So I know, I know you aren't joking. But Job could be a prototype for us. Job could be the kind of person um, that we, we, we share a lot in common with. the scripture tells us <coughs> that one day the angels came into the presence of God and Satan was with them. God asked Satan, what have you been doing? Satan replied, I have been claiming the earth for myself. Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you met my servant Job? He's down there. You met him? No one else on earth is like him. He is an honest and innocent man. And he honors God and stays away from evil. But Satan replied, Job honors God for a good reason. God, you have put a wall around him and his family and everything he owns. I can't touch him. You have blessed the things he has done. His flocks and herds are so large they almost cover the land. But if you would destroy everything he has, he will curse you to your face. 
So God accepted the challenge and said to Satan, All right then, you can do anything you want to Job, but you must not touch his body. You must not touch him. Then Satan left heaven and, and returned to earth. Our text, which is the entire Job 1, what we read, verses 13 to 22, that text gives us the following information about Job. Yes, he was a good man. He was an honest man. He was a decent man. He was happy and prosperous. He enjoyed great wealth. Job was the best of the best. There was no one else like him, God said. Job had a wonderful family, and he was a priest in his own household. Whenever his children would have a party in the evening, early in the morning, Job would offer sacrifice for each one of them, lest they sin against God. But despite Job's character and his good standing, he experienced great catastrophe and suffering. It came suddenly and it was both undeserved and unexplained. <clears throat> it was an intrusion. God made a bet on Job's faithfulness. That nothing you could do to Job to cause him to, to turn his back on God. Job served God for nothing. I know most of us are here and we are Christians because we want to go to heaven. We don't want to go anywhere else except heaven when we die. When we were in seminary, we used to make up some nice ways of presenting the gospel, like how I sang a, a verse that's not in the hymn book. <laughs> and this one is in line with the Beatitudes. And it is this, in reference to Job. Blessed are those who expect nothing, for they will never be disappointed. <laughs> Job served God for nothing. Job just loved God and expect nothing in return. And so God could bet on him. That's why Satan said, if you take away Job's stuff, he will curse you. Because he didn't know Job. <coughs> and God said, go ahead, take away everything, but don't touch the man. And Satan started his work. Job had 500 yoke of oxen. And 500 donkeys. And he lost them all at once. Along with the servants who cared for his animals, they were taken by his neighbor's disobedience. And it was Satan who put the thought into their mind to do it. Job had 7,000 sheep. And they were killed by lightning. And the shepherds were killed at the same time. In this case, Job was told 
that the destruction came from heaven. And that made it even more terrible because he looked upon it as a sign from God that he displeased God. Job had 3,000 camels that he lost, and he lost all the servants who were working with them except the one who came in, in all cases to report. You notice that these people met their demands when they were doing something. Eh? Nobody was idle yet. Everybody was doing something. They were working. They were having... Uh, I mean, the, 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 it's a regular life that we live. They were working and tragedy struck. And then Job lost his seven sons and three daughters. The older son had a birthday. And they're all there having fun during the birthday. And a storm came and blew down the house. And the house caught fire. And all his children were killed. And that's the last thing Satan did because that was the worst blow. He could give to, to Job because nothing was more precious to Job than his family, his children. And then he lost his property, he lost his children. And then the third blow, his wife gave him bad counsel. Bad advice. After all of that happened to him, she asked him, do you still hold fast to your integrity? Curse God and die. You see, Satan spared her. Because she was going to be used of Satan to tempt him and to make matters worse for him. To present him more trials. In other words, she was saying, is this a God to be still loved? Is this a God to be honored? Is this God worthy of being served? Have you ever reached a point in life where things have gotten so bad and life become so grim that you wonder if God cares for you? And should I still go to church? Why, why go to church? Why, why read the Bible if God doesn't stand up to what he promises? Look what has happened to my life. All of the years of serving him, this is what it amounts to. And then a wife or a, a dear friend come to you and ask you, are you still willing to serve him? Who appears not to care? Here's a second thing I want to point out. Is that even though we don't read it in chapter 1, the end of Job, which is, uh, Job 42, and then from verse 12 on, we see the restoration of everything Satan took from Job. Allow me to say that when you are suffering, and we do suffer sometimes, 
we, we must hold on to the conviction that God is love. God is love. And that God is good. Never lose sight of the fact that whatever happens to you, we still have a loving and a good God. And, and, and you may not know why things happen, but somebody says you'll know it by and by. You look back at some point and you could see the hand of God in your life, but when you were going through it, you couldn't understand. Job didn't understand. It was not explained to him. In the last chapter, the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had owned before. The Lord blessed the last part of Job's life, even more than the first part. Job now had 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, a thousand teams of oxen, and a thousand female donkeys. And get this, Job had seven sons, and three daughters afterwards. God restored everything to, to Job and then gave him even more. Is there anybody here this morning think that Satan has stolen things from you? Look at your family. Has Satan stolen anything from your family? Has Satan stolen anything from your finances, from your health. You see, whatever God did for Job, he will do for us, he will do it for the church. God is going to give back to the church all that Satan took. What's the evidence? You remember in St. Luke 13, verse 16, Jesus healed a woman once who was bent over and could not straighten herself. And when people criticize Jesus for healing the woman on the Sabbath, Jesus responded, Ought not this woman a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan bound for 18 years? Shouldn't she be loose? from this bond on the Sabbath day. You see, Jesus saw Satan as the one who caused this disease. Not every illness is caused by Satan. Not all your problems are caused necessarily by Satan. Sometimes we are our best enemies. In Acts 10 verse 38, Peter described Jesus as the one who went about doing good and healing all people who were oppressed by the devil. Oppressed by the devil. In other words, the devil often oppresses people with illnesses. This is one of his designs. And here is a promise in the scripture. Isaiah 58, 11 to 12. The Lord will guide you always. He will satisfy your needs in a sun's scorched land and will strengthen your faith. You will be like a well-watered garden, like a spring whose water never fails. Your people will rebuild the ancient ruins and will raise up the age-old foundations. You will be called repairer of broken walls, restorer of streets 
with dwellings. The Lord has promised to guide you. He has promised to satisfy you, to prosper you, to refresh you and raise you up and restore his people with everything that the enemy has taken from you. So the church has a bright future. And because we are part of the church, we have a bright future. Hold on. We have to hold on. We can't give up. You may know a lot of people might have experienced trials and tribulations. And God has restored them. In the fullness of time, they were restored. Hallelujah. They were restored. God lifted them. I can tell you of scores of those. You might have family members that were down and God lifted them up. You may have church brothers who were down and God lifted them up. And maybe you are down this morning, but I tell you, the time is coming when God will lift you up. And let me close with this. God does not always remove the trials or tribulations when we pray. God didn't remove the cup from Jesus as he prayed and organized in the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus prayed, if it is possible, God, let this cup pass from me. Remove it. If it is possible, God didn't. He didn't. Paul wants this thorn in the flesh to be removed. This trial and tribulation in his life to be removed, but God didn't. He says, my grace is sufficient. <laughs> my grace is sufficient. You see, and, and, and those who, 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 are, who are sick and will be listening to me sometime this week, I just want to ask them when you pray for relief from the pain and, the, and, and that plagues your body. And, and, and seemingly there is no answer. And, and maybe some of you in here have been praying to God for things that there seems to be no answer. To heal this family member. To restore this and to restore that. And, and, and there seem, there, there seem to be no answer. But you know when it comes to pain, you are not able to ignore it because pain is no illusion. But all of God's children can be sure of this. When God doesn't remove your pain and trouble, he will give you grace that is sufficient to bear it. Paul says three times I pleaded with the Lord to take away my pain, my trial, my tribulation. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness. And Paul says, therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weakness so that Christ's power may rest on me that is why for christ's sake i delight in weakness in insults in hardships in persecutions in difficulties for when i am weak then i am strong yes jesus healed the sick yes jesus gave sight to the blind and hearing to the deaf yes Jesus enabled the lame to walk. But does he care about my trials and my tribulations? When I'm locked away in my house and nobody sees, and I go on my knees and I pray and nothing seemed to happen, does Jesus care? Listen to the words of assurance 
Does Jesus care when my heart is in pain? Too deeply for mirth or song as the burden press and the cares distress and the way grows weary and long? Does Jesus care when my way is dark with a nameless dread and fear? As the daylight fades and the deep night shades, does he care enough to be near? Does Jesus care when I've tried and failed to resist some temptation strong? When for my deep grief I find no relief, then my tears flow all night long. The refrain, oh yes, he cares. Oh yes, he cares. His heart is touched with my grief. This is someone who has experienced it. Not someone who has read about it, but someone who has experienced it. He says, oh yes. I know he cares. His heart is Touch with my grief. When the days are weary and the long nights dreary, I know my Savior cares. Have you ever been to bed and the night seems long because of the burdens, because of the trials and the tribulations? Some people say, I turn on the side and I turn on the side and there's no. The psalmist says, oh, if I had wings like a dove, I would fly away. You see, with faith in his love, with faith in his kindness, we can face trials with the confidence that God cares. So let us trust Jesus to help us overcome all the pain associated with being human beings. And let us rejoice in the fact that there will come a day when there will be no more pain, no more trials, no more tribulations, no more suffering, and no more trouble. Our hope is that we look forward to a time when we will no longer have to suffer under the sin of this world and under the weights of our trials. In the meanwhile, just in the meanwhile, take the name of Jesus with you. Child of Sorrow and of joy. Take the name of Jesus with you. He is the author and finisher of our faith. And he is our deliverer. Will you trust him? Trust him now. Amen. <laughs>
We praise God for who he is. And for his care for us. I just pray that this week, as you live your life, I don't know what's going to happen. But sometimes trials come our way. Never forget that God cares. And he will not give you more than you can bear. Trust me on that one. And his grace is sufficient to keep you, to uphold you, to sustain you. And we look forward. We, we are in no rush to leave this earth. I personally am in no rush. But I know when the day comes, I'll go to a place where there will be no more trials and tribulations. For Revelation tells us for God himself shall be in the midst. Hallelujah. And he will wipe away all tears. And that's the last of it. Tears of joy for the former things will be no more. Amen. That's our faith. Let us pray. Oh Lord, thank you for the hope we have in Jesus. What a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege it is to carry everything to you. We bring our burdens, our trials, our tribulations. And we know that your power enables us to be triumphant and victorious in all these things. We trust you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Now and always. Amen. Amen.